So welcome to the session of segmentation, detection, 3D scene understanding. So I am Inse Zhou from Postech. I'm Lourdes Agapito from UCL. Yeah, before starting, I'd like to remind you that there are two ways of questioning. Uh, using microphone on the floor or uh, using the Slido app and online. So please use Slido app as much as you can. So and then let's get started this session. All right, today I'll be presenting our work, EOL Act for Real-Time Instant Segmentation. Instant Segmentation is a successor task to object detection, where instead of predicting the boxes around each object in an image, we predict what pixels belong to each object. Current instant segmentation methods are accurate, but they can't do better than around 10 FPS on modern hardware without significantly compromising their performance. This is because they're forced to perform an expensive repooling operation, in this case, ROI align for mask CNN, and because of their second stage, which means that computation in the model happens sequentially. As a result, no method can achieve competitive results on the challenging COCO dataset at even close to 30 FPS. Our goal is to fill in this blue region here. So the question is, can we create a one-stage instance segmenter that doesn't use repooling and is fast enough to be real-time? One key benefit of a two-stage method is that it allows mass to be produced as an output of a conv layer. This is important as instance mass are spatially coherent and conv layers maintain these spatial relationships. So we want to keep this property. But it's not entirely clear how to do this in a one-stage model without using repooling. Because that's, this is because by the time you predict objects in a one-stage detector, you no longer have any spatial information. Thus, if we want to produce mask in such a model, we need to create them somewhere else in the network. Because of this, we split mass computation into two parts. First, we predict a set of prototype masks, the size of the entire image, that aren't specific to any one instance. This forms a sort of dictionary that we can combine in different ways to create different output masks. And they can be easily obtained as the output feature maps of a simple, fully convolutional network parallel to the detector. Then, the way we combine these prototypes is through a simple linear combination. This can be implemented as a single matrix multiplication for all detections in the image, making it very fast. Also, our architecture is as follows. First, we use the standard ResNet plus FPN as our backbone. Then we attach a fully convolutional network to the largest FPN layer in order to produce these full image prototype masks. In this example, we have four, but in general, we use 32. In parallel, we use the standard prediction head that already produces class and box regressors and simply add to it these K linear combination coefficients. Then for the detection surviving NMS, we produce their mass by doing the previously mentioned matrix multiplication. Finally, we do some minimal post-processing to get the output mass. As you can see, if we vary the coefficients used, we can produce different mass using the same set of prototypes, like for this person and this tennis racket. Then to train our mass branch, we apply a pixel-wise loss on only the final assembled mass. Thus, the prototypes and linear combination coefficients only get downstream supervision from the mask loss, meaning that they, don't ha are, they are not constrained by any semantics. This leads to the prototypes taking on some interesting behavior, including translation variance in a fully convolutional network. And you can come to our poster session at post number one to see how this is possible. Finally, the result is that we're the first real-time method above 30 FPS to achieve competitive results on COCO. Our base model does better than FCS while at 33 FPS on a Titan XP. Here are some qualitative results. And of course, it wouldn't be a real-time method if I didn't show a real-time demo. So here's a screen recording of live webcam footage being processed in real time and without any temporal smoothing. The GPU and model used are at the top along with the FPS, and you can see uh, using a Titan XP, our base model can attain a consistent 30 FPS. There's still some artifacts, so there's room for improvement. And then here's a 1080 Ti running the Darknet 53 model. The video is being loaded from a disk, but it's still being processed and displayed in real time.
And here's the webcam again, but this time running on a laptop 2070 GPU using the ResNet 50 model. You can he see here that even on a laptop, this demo is consistently above 20 FPS. And this is the demo we gave yesterday, and hopefully we'll be able to give at our poster presentation given the availability of an outlet. You'll act as 100% open source and written entirely in native PyTorch. So feel free to give our GitHub a visit at the link here, and I respond to issues, so please ask away. There's a lot I couldn't cover in this talk, so please come to Poster One to learn more. And thanks for listening. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the paper I present today is Expectation Maximization Attention Networks for Semantic Segmentation. This paper adopts EM algorithm to make the self-attention mechanism more efficient and effective. The authors are listed here, and they all come from Peking University, China. So it is well known that fully convolutional networks based methods have been the mainstream for the semantic segmentation task. However, the convolution operation limits effective recept file for final outputs. Uh, the self-attention module can aggregate global context. It shows lighting this problem. Here, Network Neural Network is a representation work published in 2017. As shown in the left picture, the feature of Pixel XI is updated uh, the weighted average of all pixels features. And the weight between pixel i and pixel g is calculated at their normalized correlation. So you can see the whole structure of a network module on the right. So uh, the correlation has to be computed for each pixel pair the complexity for the network module will be O n square, where n is the number of pixels on the input feature map. So from the view of dictionary learning, network module just adopts pixel features themselves as the dictionary and regard the weights as the coding. So obviously, this dictionary is very redundant and the adjacent pixels are quite similar with each other. Therefore, we want to find the small dictionary, or named a compact set, a basis to represent the whole feature map. So by which the computation cost and memory requirements can reduce by a large margin. Moreover, the broad low rank property can denoise the feature map implicitly. And in this paper, we propose to use EM algorithm to find this compact basis. Concretely, give the feature map S with n pixels and uh, the dictionary mu with k items. In the E step, we calculate the correlation matrix between them, or the so-called attention map Z. And in the M step, the normalized attention map multiplies with the feature map X to re-estimate the dictionary. The E step and S step run iteratively, and finally they reconstruct the feature map, which is a low rank. So we first did ablation studies on the iteration numbers for training and inference. From the figure, we found that for training, just three iterations are enough for the EM steps, and for inference, more iterations are better. Moreover. The detailed comparison with Deep Labs and PSNA net shows that the proposed EMA net is both more effective and more efficient. And in the paper, we also state how its square nets can be regarded as a special case of EMA net, for which the number of iterations is set as one. The comparison with its square net and the EMA net shown on the upper right can convince this statement. And the comparison with the network module shows the low rank property also contributes. On the bottom right, we show visualizations of some attention maps corresponding to different dictionary items. It is clear, even without direct supervision, these items can converge to some specific semantics. 
And from another point of view, EM iterations is just a soft version of clustering. The proposed EM net achieved the state of the arts on several benchmarks at that time. These benchmarks include puzzle VLC, Cocoa Stuff, and puzzle Contest. And notably, with RedNet 101 as backbone, we outperformed previous method by large margin. This QR code direct to the website of the project. You can find anything you want. And my poster is at number one. So that's all. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yifan Zhao from Beihang University. Today, let me introduce our paper, The Multi-Class Path Parsing with Joint Boundary and Semantic Awareness. Firstly, let me introduce the motivation of our paper. The multi-class path parsing is to understanding and parsing multiple objects into different parts. Given an input image, the single class path parsing is only parsing one object of one category, for example, the person of the second image. However, the multi-class path parsing is to parsing all the objects occurred in the image. For example, we need to parse the house and uh, the person and the cars occurred in the third image. And it will motivate the understanding of the image and the interact in interaction of the world. However, we face two typical challenges in the multi-class path parsing problem. The first one is the inaccurate boundary localization. We can see from the first column, uh, first image, and uh, we see the yellow box, the red, red line arm of the young girl. And the second challenge is the inter-class appearance ambiguity. We call it uh, the semantic ambiguity. We can see from the head of the bus, which was wrongly segmented. To solve these two problems, we propose our method based on the boundary and the semantic awareness models. Our method is based on the conventional segmentation backbones, and we add the boundary awareness model based on the special attention mechanism, which was regularized by the boundary attention. And finally, with all these features, we use the semantic awareness model to incorporate the object segmentation information and finally, these features are fused together to form the final output. To be more specific, the boundary awareness module is to regularize the features to focus on boundaries. And we use the generated path boundaries, which are from the annotated masks. And we use the softmax edge regularization to regularize the feature maps. And we use the self attention mechanism to enhance the future, and these features are fused together to form the final output. And for the differences and the relations, the figure A and the figure B are two typical ways of the top-down pyramid decoder and the lateral connected decoders. Different from these decoders, our proposed decoder uses the boundary awareness laws, which are regularized by the part boundaries and we're using special attention to enhance the feature representation. And for the experiments, in the multi-class settings, you can see from the last column of our paper, uh, of our image, we generate more accurate boundaries and in the second line, our method generates more accurate and here are some more results compared to the ground truth and the baseline models of the deep life version 3. Our method outperformed the state of art methods on the public possible part benchmark and improved about 7.8 improvements. And our model is trained without MS Coco per training. And also, for the single class sightings, our method generates more re reliable results. And in the last column, we realize the attention results generated predicted by our module. And finally, we summarize our paper. We make the first attempt in this nice explored multi-class path passing problem. 
and we propose a unified framework framework to solve this important problem. And we propose two different modules: the boundary awareness module to solve the path level ambiguities, and the semantic awareness module to solve the class level ambiguities. And finally, our model achieved the state of art results on the both multitask and the conventional single class settings. And that's all. Thank you. Please find us in the third poster session. Thanks for your attention. So now we have time for question and answering. All the three speakers, please come up to the stage. And any questions from the floor? Uh, please come to the microphone on the floor. Okay, there's one. Yeah. Okay, I have Ah, uh, I appreciate your nice presentation. I have a question for the second presentation. Okay, uh, you use the expectation maximization algorithm to generate some kind of redundant and and small to you ex exploit the smaller base smaller number of bases. As far as I know, there are other ways to use a smaller number of bases, such as compressive sensing or sparse coding. Is there any uh, is there any advantage using expectation maximization other than uh, other that kind of algorithms for redundant bases? Uh, okay, actually, EM algorithm here just because I can make it fully differentiable, so I can embed it into the network very easily. So um, it can also back propagate the gradient with other modules. And uh, further, we can embed it anywhere in the network instead of just the segmentation head. How, however, sparse coding or compressive sensing algorithms is also differentiable. And we can also calculate a uh, gradient you no. know, from the loss function. I, I, I cannot. Uh, figure out uh, what's the uh, big difference between those two algorithms by applying to the smallest, while using smaller set of bases to express the, uh, uh, the, 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 the images using yeah. your module. So uh, by now, I haven't uh, say uh, works uh, to embed this algorithm into a deep network. So. Uh, if we, they can be made fully differentiable, I think they are also promising in the future. Okay, thank you. So I also have one question online uh, from the Slido. So this is the question for paper number one. The question is, uh, how can the coefficient help to discern uh, connected instances of the same object class? So the prototypes themselves find uh, a way to learn translation variance just through backprop. So, um, and the way they do it, we hypothesize, is that uh, fully convolutional networks are not fully co uh, not translation variant because they have a, a consistent border of padding pixels around all the inputs to keep the inputs and outputs the same resolution. So this gives a kind of consistent uh, border that the network can latch onto and create kernels to kind of uh, percolate that inward to the image, which creates translation uh, variance. Okay, this is the question for paper number three. Can you explain how the model can extract boundary information? The boundary information is abstracted from the attention module with, with a self-attention mechanism, which was regularized by the novelly generalized from the part of segmentation annotations. Thank you. Uh, let's thank the speakers again and move on to the next session. Two. Hello everyone, I'm Ren Jie from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Today I'm going to talk about explaining neural networks semantically and quantitatively. The interpretability of networks is related to the trustworthiness and safety of the <coughs> network. The previous studies usually interpret the network at the pixel level, like GreCam and the realization of futures. This method only gives us qualitative explanations. 
In contrast to previous explanations, we aim to explain the network thematically and quantitatively. Given a pre-trained network and a predefined viral concept, we aim to estimate the numerical contributions of these viral concepts to the final predictions. More crucially, we aim to explain the network with clear viral concepts and analyze the contribution of viral concepts. Here we show an example. We can see that head and torso are the most important parts for the classification of the bird. The target network to explain is called a performer. The basic idea is to distill knowledge from the performer into an explainer network. The explainer aims to decompose the overall prediction score into scores of compositional viral concepts. The objective is to let the explainer to mimic the logic of the performer and estimate weights for the viral concepts. The weights of viral concepts are formulated as a function of the input. Here, the viral concepts are manually defined by people. You can use off-the-shelf models or training models to represent the viral concepts. In real applications, there are two typical cases. In the first case, features in the intermediate layers of the network are interpretable. In the second case, a network is learned for multiple viral concepts, and these viral concepts share features in the intermediate layers. Note that the knowledge distillation may yield biased interpretation. For example, a prediction may depend on various viral concepts. However, as shown in the left figure, we can see that the bias interpretation only assign very few concepts with high contributions. Thus, we define a prior loss. We define the following priors as an additional penalty loss to overcome the bias interpretation problems. Here the, bias in, here the prior laws are used in the early epochs to avoid the bias interpretation problem. We define two typical types of priors for real applications as follows. Finally, we show our experimental results. In the first experiment, we used object parts to explain the classification score of animals for the car in the first image, for example, we can see that torso, leg, and horn are the most important parts for the classification. In the second experiment, we try to explain the attractive attribute with other facial attributes. Here we can see that for the woman in the first image, the most important reasons for her attractiveness include not blurry, not chubby, no gray hair, and young. In conclusion, we focus on a new explanation strategy, explaining the network thematically and quantitatively. We propose to distill knowledge from a pre-trained performer into an explainer, and we develop a novel loss to overcome the bias interpretation problem. Theoretically, the proposed method is a generic solution to various tasks and networks. Please come to our poster for more, de for more details. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kai Xin from National University of Singapore. Today, I'm going to introduce our work on field short segmentation. So, field short segmentation is a task that, given a support set containing several images with their pixel level labels, the goal is to segment the objects of the same class in the query images. It is closely related to field short classification where we have only image level labels. The query images, they may contain objects from different classes. Usually, 
the task is formulated as n way k short task, where n way means we have n object classes, and k short means there are k images in each class. Our work is built upon the prototypical network for few short classification. Supporter images are first embedded into class specific prototypes. Next, in order to classify the query image, we compare the distance between the query feature and each prototype, and then assign the label of the nearest one to the query image. In our few short segmentation model, similarly, we first extract features from the images. Since we now have the ground truth pixel level labels for the support images, we can group the support features according to the cat object category. Next, support features in each class are averaged into class-specific prototypes, and there's one extra prototype for the background class. In order to segment the query image, for each query feature vector, we calculate its distance to each prototype and then assign the label of the nearest one. In this way, we can obtain the segmentation results of the query image. So on top of that, we notice that the pixel level annotations of the support set are only used in masking the feature vectors. They are not fully utilized to help segment the query image. We therefore propose a prototype alignment module to help. First, we use a predicted query mask to get another set of prototypes from the query features. The intuition is that the prototypes obtained from the query features should stay close to the prototypes from the support images. If we use this set of prototypes to segment the query, the support images, it should produce equally good results. Essentially, we are exchanging the roles of support and query and perform a reversed process of few short segmentation. So, so here is the overall pipeline of our method. Note that the prototype alignment part is only in the training stage. It also introduces no extra learnable parameter so the model size is kept unchanged. Besides, it is fast to compute because we already have the features. Here are the results on one-way settings. Given a support image with its pixel level mask, our model is able to segment the objects of the same class, like basically in this example in the query images. On the benchmark data set, our model outperforms the previous work by a large margin but with smaller model size. Our model can also deal with cases where more than one object classes are presented and provide a strong baseline for future works. In another experiment, during testing, we replace the mask annotations of the support images with weak annotations, such as scribbles and bounding boxes. Surprisingly, the performance only drops a little compared to use dense pixel level annotations. In conclusion, we extend prototype learning from classification to segmentation. The query to support segmentation al aligns the prototypes and better utilize the support masks. When replacing pixel level label masks with weak annotations, there's only a little performance drop. So thank you for your attention. We will be at post five for more discussions on the video cases and the limitations of our model. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Wei Cheng from Google. Today, I'm happy to tell you about our work, Shape Mask, learning to segment novel objects by refining shape priors. Here, in the past few years, we've seen great success of instant segmentation. Here's an example of Mask RCNN. The Achilles heel of all these approaches, however, is that they all require pixel-wise labels for every category. You can imagine this is unscalable to the real world. The real world contains a lot of long tail and open set categories with few or no labels at all. Researchers have tried clustering and transfer learning to address this problem, but we're still far from the fully supervised performance. 
How about the good old shape priors? Let's say you have seen the shape of a zebra. Shouldn't that help you segment other animals? In fact, some classical works have shown the effectiveness of shape priors for segmentation and generalization. So can we bring these to instant segmentation? The standard approach is to go directly from pixel to segmentation. We propose to add box prior, detection prior, and course mask as intermediate predictions. All stages are learnable and jointly trained. Here's the overview of our system. We'll zoom into each part. First, we construct the shape prior base. We cluster the training mask and take the centroids as shape priors. Then we compose the shape priors into detection priors. We predict the shape distribution over the cluster centroids, and then we produce the detection prior by weighted sum of the shape prior. Then we refine the detection prior into a coarse mask. We fuse the detection prior with the image crop features and feed it through a fully convolutional network. Then we refine the coarse mask into a fine mask. We extract an instance embedding from the coarse mask, and then we predict the pixels that are most similar to the embeddings as the foreground. This approach leveraged the self-consistency within the object for better generalization. We have two sets of categories A and B. We train on A with both box and mask labels, and B with only box labels. We evaluate on B for mass. This tests the transfer of mass A to mass B. We outperform the state-of-the-art approach by six point on COCO, VOC to non-VOC transfer, and four point the other way around. Visualization shows that we can segment a lot of novel categories nicely without seeing any of the pixel labels at the training time. We are, we are able to achieve the same performance as Mascar CNN with 0.2% of the training data on the generalization task. Apart from generalization, we achieve state-of-the-art competitive results of 40 mask AP when all the labels are available. We also observe a positive correlation between the prior and the final mask. When the prior prediction is good, final mask tends to be great also. In addition, our mask is robust to mislocalized detections by design. It is able to go outside of the detections to capture the full extent of the object. Finally, we apply shape mask on a robot and find that it works well on many unseen categories, such as a plush toy, a paper, or a power outlet. The model is trained on Coco only. In conclusion, we learn to segment novel objects by refining shape priors. And we have state-of-the-art results on COCO by a good margin. The code has been released. Thank you. Please visit us at Poster 6. Can we have all the speakers up on stage, please, for the questions? So the first, OK, there, there's a person. Hi. There. I have a question about the first paper. So you train this explainer network using distillation. So how can you be sure that the second, the explainer network still resembles what the actual network does? Uh, first, we think that uh, our explainer is an anti-model and this anti-model is uh, very transparent. Second, we evaluate our results on two aspects. First, we evaluate the correctness and we develop some metric like 
uh, entropy, uh, like a conditional entropy. And secondly, we, ima uh, we evaluate our limit uh, uh, and we can decompose the interpretable components from the unexplainable components. And with these evaluations, we think our results are uh, correct and uh, uh, very uh, direct. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question for the third speaker. Um, so how, how the third speaker? Oh, <laughs> the third speaker, please. Yes. So how does the the number of shape priors affect the the performance of your method? Um, it is actually pretty robust against the number of shape priors. Even with very few shape priors, we can do well. Yeah. And, and how about the, uh, the the diversity of the of the shape priors? Um, how does how does that affect? It is pretty robust, so it's not like yeah. So which one is the, the most model. crucial? I mean, among those priors, which one is most crucial in the performance? Right. Among the shape priors, you know, different kinds. So which one is most crucial in the performance? Can you summarize that? The effect. Um, the, um, in my study, we found that it's important to have shape priors. That's the most important thing. If you don't have shape priors, the model just doesn't generalize. But if you have some reasonable amount of shape priors, it would work well. Okay. We have another question from the floor. This is for the P PA net paper. Um, have you done any experiments on instance segmentation, and do you expect it to generalize to instances from the same category since you're doing some sort of clustering? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So I think that's uh, maybe one of the limitations of our model because uh, we extract the features to form the prototypes of the same class, but it may be hard to distinguish between the different insta insta instance of the same semantic class. So uh, I think maybe they are. Uh, Have you tried it or? I haven't tried it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, just a, a final question for the third speaker as well. Um, so, do you think that the shape prior can hurt segmentations in the case of irregular shapes? Um, We haven't observed too many examples like that because even if shape prior is not good, the model still can learn to refine. Um, it has all these refinement stages to fix it. Okay. All right. So thank you to all the speakers. So can we have the next speaker, please? Yeah. By the way, please sit in the front, all the speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yun Tao Chen from Institute of Automation, Chinese Academy of Sciences. In the next five minutes, I will give a brief introduction of our sequence level semantics aggregation for video object detection. Video object detection is different from still image object detection in that a single frame of video may not contain enough information for us to fully recognize the object of interest. As demonstrated by the image in the right, we can see from the image that there are two animals fighting, but we could not determine what animals they are due to the visual appearance degradation caused by the motion blur. But a video contains far more information than a single frame. There are some frames that are clearer than others. So how to utilize the clear views to help object detection in the blurred ones becomes a central problem for video object detection. Many previous works use optical flow to enhance the features of degraded images. This is an intuitive choice as optical flow is a natural representation for the motion in video. <laughs> But optical flow has its limits, since it's mainly described low-level, pixel-wise motion. Low-level vision cues are fragile to appearance changes, and the pixel-wise description is noisy and inconsistent. This causes flow-based feature aggregation methods 
tend to fail under fast motion. Now, let us think about how we human recognize objects in the video. First, although we may not be able to identify the exact category of an object that's moving very fast, but we could easily locate it. And later, when we get a clear view of this object, we immediately know what we have seen by associating the clear views with the blurred ones. So we human relate objects across frames by their visual appearances. This inspires us to perform feature aggregation via visual semantics instead of optical flow. Our method first generates class agnostic object proposals for a random subset of video frames. And then, for each proposal, we aggregate, we aggregate features from other proposals weighted by their semantic similarity. The enhanced proposal features are then fed to the downstream subnetworks for classification and regression. Since our CSR does not rely on flow information, we can aggregate features from the whole video sequence instead of just from temporal neighbor's frames. By utilizing a larger set of frames, our method could generate far more robust features than the optical flow-based ones. Despite its simplicity, our CSR achieves huge performance gain over the strong, faster RCN baseline. CSR improves nearly 10% for objects under fast motion in terms of MAP, which shows the effectiveness of semantic aggregations in the sequence level. An added bonus of our method is that it does not require any box level post-processing since our methods already take good use of the sequence information. This further simplifies the whole pipeline for video detection. As most sequence of the ImageNet VID dataset contains only a single object, we also benchmark our method on the more challenging application dataset. The application dataset contains daily cooking activities recorded from a head-mounted Eagle camera. Here we use the same hyperparameters derived from the VID dataset. And our method still attain decent improvement for both the seen and unseen scenes. Here are some take home messages. First, the feature aggregation is an essential for video level tasks. And most importantly, Semantics aggregation is both simple and effective. Thanks for your audience, and welcome to poster number seven for further discussions. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Sun Wu from Yangtze University. In this paper, we introduce our best and accurate method for semi-supervised video object segmentation. Uh, this is a joint work with Jun Young Lee and Ning Xu at our research and my advisor, Sanju Kim. The problem is defined as follows. Given a video, the ground truth mask for the first frame is provided. Then, the goal is to estimate the object mask for all the remaining frames in the video. By the nature of the problem, available cues become richer with the intermediate pre prediction of model. Even though the initial object mask is, is given only for the first frame, we can access mask information for the intermediate frames estimated beforehand. As most tasks in computer vision, many deep learning ha methods have been introduced to solve this challenging problem. With deep learning approaches to run a deep networks, the essential question is uh, wh from which frame should the networks run the queue? Let's review some of the previous approaches in this perspective. Propagation-based method used the previous frame to propagate its object mask toward the current frame. In this setting, the networks learns the temporal coherency between the frames for propagation. 
On the other hand, detection-based method make use of the first frame as a reference frame to detect target object at the current frame. This method runs the appearance of target object to match them across frames. To compensate for uh, the weakness of two aforementioned approaches, uh, hybrid methods are recently proposed. In this case, both of the first and the previous frames are used. However, the intermediate frames are still not attracting attention despite its importance. To this end, we propose an uh, base approach based on the memory networks that possibly use all the available information, including the intermediate frames. All the previous frames with object mask can be embedded into, into the memory, and the usable information is read through the attention mechanism. In detail, memory frames are first uh, encoded into pairs of key value feature map through the memory encoder. If there are more than one memory frames, each frame is uh, independently processed and the memory is formed by simply combining them through the concatenation. Similarly, the query frame is also encoded by the dedicated encoder network. Key values from the memory and the query frames are then go through our space-time memory read operation. In this operation, relevant information to the query frame is retrieved from the memory. Finally, the decoder ta takes the output of memory read block and the reconstruct object mask for the query frame. More details can be found at our process presentation. We first evaluate our method on YouTube VOS dataset, which is the largest benchmark for the semi-supervised video object segmentation. As shown in the table, our method outperforms all the previous approaches by a large margin in all metrics. Next, we evaluate our method on the Davis dataset. This is a quality versus timing plot on Davis 2017 validation set. Our method is the fastest and the most accurate of all published methods. This is a qualitative comparison on Davis benchmark. We compare our method against one-shot detection method and uh, OSVS and our uh, best hybrid method, RGMP, and previous Davis challenge winner, Primbos. Our method shows stable results over challenging test videos while learning in a fraction of time compared to state-of-the-art methods that usually adopt online learning. Please visit, visit our poster session for the details and more research and discussion. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I'm here to present our work. There are short video object segmentation via alternative graph neural networks. This task is for segmenting primary video objects from the background without any test time human supervision. The main challenges lie in two aspects. First, it suffers from the general challenges in video processing, such as object occlusion, scale variation, appearance change, and so on. The second one is how to automatically discover the prominent objects. For example, in such a complex video, how can we determine the primary objects without any prior knowledge about the foreign ground? Current top performing methods use local temporal information, recurrent neural networks, or two stream architectures, and perform this task in a local and a sequential manner. As they, do not, as, as they only use successful information from a local wheel, they ignore the rich relations among arbitrary frames. Take this video as an example. If we only look at a few frames, it's hard to determine the primary object. So current method fail to capture the video content from a global level. Based on above analysis, we propose an alternative graph neural network, AGNN, which recasts this task as an end-to-end message passing based graph information fusion procedure. Specifically, the video is represented as a fully connected graph. 
The graph nodes are the video frames. The edges are the pairwise relations between the two frames. Through message passing, our model can capture high order relationships among video frames and better understanding the video content from a global view. After the information diffusion, we can obtain better video representation. Here is the overall network architecture of our model in the training step. Basically, it contains three stages. First, we initialize the node and edge features of the video graph. Then, we achieve the information diffusion over the video graph by a gated message passing process. Finally, the segmentation results are read out from the final node representation. More specifically, we first build a directed graph G as the video representation. Then we use a deep lab V3 like backbone network architecture to extract the frame features. After that, with the initial node features, we compute the loop edge embeddings by an inter attention module, which captures the interrelationship between each node features. This can be built as a special attention mechanism. To mine the pairwise relationships between any pair of nodes, we design an inter attention module. It captures the correlations between two nodes in a in a high-level embedding space. After the initialization of node and edge embeddings, a message passing based information diffusion process is performed for gathering the global information over the video graph. This is achieved by iteratively performing the two steps. First, a gated message diffusion process is designed to selectively collect information from other nodes. This here, the gate machinism is used to fit out the noisy information from other irrelevant features, uh, frames. Then, we use the convolutional GRU-based update functions to iteratively update the node features. After several message passing steps, the final node embeddings successfully capture global information. Then, a convolutional readout function is used to get the final segmentation predictions. We first test our model on object level zero short video object segmentation. We can see our method outperforms other competitors. We also modify our method for instance level segmentation setting. Again, our method improves the state of the arts. Here are the results on two example videos under object level and instance level setting respectively. We further apply our model on image object co-segmentation co task, which needs to extract the common objects from a set of semantically related images. The promising results suggest that our model not only learns the appearance correspondence between video frames, but also captures the semantic relations within the image groups. We have made our implementation publicly available, and my post number is number nine. Thank you, that's all. And now time for question and answering. All the three uh, speakers who come to the stage. Any question from the floor? Okay, I have uh, one question for paper number eight, uh, the second uh, speaker. So basically in your uh, memory construction for video segmentation, uh, so what if there are low quality masks in your memory? So how do you deal with this? Uh, unstable result. Um, I'm not really understand your question. Can you repeat the question again? Yeah, low quality, low quality mask estimation in your memory. If you have those, uh, okay. you know, low quality. Um, uh, actually, our method is based on the attention mechanism, and uh, so, uh, yeah, low, low quality mask can be a problem in our uh, framework because the low quality uh, mask. With a high matching score, it can corrupt uh, other estimations. So it, it will be uh, maybe challenging for this kind of approach. So do you have any selection mechanism you know, to handle this issue? Um, actually, we provide a, not a binary mask, and uh, we provide a soft, uh, soft score for the each pixel. So the talk may can decide this, this kind of this uh, low Low-competent pixel is not reliable, so they can choose to uh, not, 
not to not choosing them. Okay, thank yeah. you. So I have a question for paper number nine, uh, the third speaker. So uh, did you compare your model to other general shot methods, such as uh, edge detection plus thresholding methods, other baselines? Sorry, other what methods? Uh, other general shot methods, such as some combination of uh, edge detector and thresholding, or oh, any other baselines like that. OK, since this work, it follows the general protocol in the short video of segmentation. Uh, maybe it's different for the settings with the mentioned method, so we only compare this method in the their short video of segmentation domain. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. A question for uh, paper number seven, the first speaker. Uh, what happens if there are intermediate frames where you don't have any object visible? Uh, this is a challenge facing by all the feature recognition methods. And uh, since, since during the training, the supervision signal will force you, to, they will force you methods to choose the, fr the meaningful feature for aggregation. So maybe at the initial stage, you will aggregate some wrong features. But later, through the training, you will, you will not choose to aggregate those features. OK. Uh, any other questions from the floor? I think there is one. All right. No, ah, I see. Okay, now let's move on to the next session and please uh, thank the speakers again. Can the three speakers please sit in the front seats? We really start. Hi, uh, my name is Orr from Stanford University. I'm going to present MeteorNet, deep learning on dynamic 3D point cloud sequences. Many applications require understanding the 3D environment from 3D, <coughs> from the actual 3D point cloud signals, such as robotics, autonomous driving, and augmented reality. We are interested in analyzing 3D point cloud sequences instead of a single point cloud. Why? because many applications can only be solved given multiple frames of point clouds. For example, the acceleration of an object is a second order derivative of its position, requiring at least three frames to obtain. Action recognition requires understanding human motion pattern from a sequence of data. <coughs> to estimate or predict <coughs> an object position, Accumulating information over multiple frames is helpful. There are several challenges for processing 3D point cloud sequences. First, unlike video or image sequence, which has a regular array structure, a point cloud sequence has irregular structure. Second, points in the same frame are unordered, uh, and the points from different frames are ordered in time. Third, neighboring points form a meaningful local structure. In point cloud sequences, points that are close both spatially and temporally, they should be considered neighbors. How can we leverage dynamic 3D point cloud sequences for better um, perception? We propose a new deep architecture that encodes spatiotemporal features. We propose a new deep architecture with a core module we call Meteor Module. It can um, satisfy the three properties of a point cloud sequence. For each point in the point cloud sequence, for example, this point I, we find its neighboring points in the dashed box. Within the neighborhood, we concatenate the feature vector of each point and their relative spatiotemporal location to point I into a long vector. Then, we send all these long vectors into shared neural networks. The results obtained after element-wise max pooling will be the updated feature of point I. 
Our architecture is invariant to permutation of order of points in the same frame, and time coordinate distinguishes points from different frames. In terms of determining spatio-temporal neighborhood, we propose two ways. For more details, please come to the poster. We also provide the theoretical foundation of our architecture that ensures universal approximation of the point cloud sequences. We showcase our network in three tasks, classification, segmentation, and scene flow estimation. We are interested in how these applications can benefit from dynamic point cloud sequences. On MSR Action 3D dataset, our network outperforms previous descriptor-based methods and single-frame point cloud-based methods. The more frames we use, the better classification accuracy we get. On Cynthia dataset, our network outperforms grid-based methods and achieves the state-of-the-art results. We also evaluate on Kitty with similar conclusion. Here is a visualization on Cynthia dataset. The majority of objects can be correctly segmented. We also show the results on Flying Things 3D dataset. Again, our network outperforms previous baseline methods that take two frames as input. We also evaluated on Kitty with similar conclusions. Link to the open source code is in this QR code. For more details, please check out our poster number 10 in poster session. Thanks for your attention. Hi, I'm John Lahoud from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, presenting the paper, 3D Instance Segmentation via Multitask Metric Learning. This is the joint work with Bernard, Mark, and Martin. We're interested in the task of 3D instant segmentation. Given a 3D scene acquired with depth sensors and has been processed with 3D reconstruction techniques, our target is to group parts of the same object instance. To the right is an example of the desired output, where different instances of an object, say sofa, are given different labels as opposed to semantic segmentation, where all sofas would have the same label. Instant segmentation has been a popular task in 2D, but was less explored in 3D, thanks to new 3D instant segmentation datasets, such as ScanNet, this task has been made achievable. Most 3D instant segmentation methods can be grouped into three main types. Methods of the first type apply 2D instant segmentation to the images that were used to, rec to reconstruct the scene, and track the object to accumulate the labels. This benefits from the advancement in the 2D domain, but is computationally inefficient and cannot process 3D scenes directly. Methods of the second type regress 3D bounding boxes and assign a mask for every box. Such methods work well in 2D, but stumble upon the much bigger search space in 3D. The third type learns a feature embedding for every constituent of a scene, such that the object instances can be easily grouped in the feature space we choose to use this type. We first start with a feature embedding learning strategy using a network inspired from SSCNet. The idea is to regress into a feature space in which parts of the same instance are closer to each other. This has been previously proposed in 2D and concurrent work has tested it in 3D. Nevertheless, this learning becomes harder with larger scenes containing many instances as well as similar instances outside the receptive field. To circumvent these difficulties, we propose to add a second task, in which we estimate the directional information of the instance's center of mass. This information is well defined and does not require global knowledge of the whole scene. Given a 3D scene, we first run it through a semantic labeling algorithm, SparseComNet in this case. We then voxelize our scene where voxels would hold the semantic information. 
we then train a network to generate our two outputs. The first output is the feature embedding, which group voxels of the same instance and separates clusters with different instance labels. Nevertheless, since the feature embedding scope space is not a well-defined space, as it is mostly governed by push and pull forces in random directions, we propose to add a constraint output to regularize our first task. This output represents the directions towards the center of mass of objects in 3D. Here are the losses that we used in our experiments. To the left are the push and pull forces that we adopt from 2D. And we add the loss to the right, which penalizes the directions that do not point towards the center of mass. In our network architecture, we use multiple layers of dilated convolutions to achieve a high receptive field while keeping the same resolution. During test time, we propose object instances by applying mean shift clustering on the feature embedding output with multiple thresholds, as well as connected components. We finally score our proposals using a direction embedding score and a feature embedding score. These are some qualitative results on ScanNet. Here we overlay the voxel labels back into the original mesh. Our method generates smoother outputs and succeeds in separating touching objects. We test our approach on ScanNet validation set and compare to three baselines. The first baseline is a naive baseline where we use the semantic label as an instance label. The second baseline is connected component, which is a stronger baseline in 3D. The third baseline represents the use of feature embedding alone without the direction embedding. In our proposed multitask approach, which generates feature embeddings and direction embeddings, we were able to achieve an increase of more than 20% in AP50 score over the best baseline. We also submitted to the ScanNet 3D instance segmentation benchmark, and at the time of submission, our method achieved state-of-the-art performance in terms of AP50 score. And that's me giving the winner talk at the CPPR ScanNet Challenge Workshop. Thank you, and for more details, or if you have a postdoc position opening, please pass by poster 11. Thanks. Hello everyone, we are from Kaos again. I'm happy to be here and introduce our work, DeepGCN to you. The main concern of our paper is, can GCNs go as deep as CNNs? As we know, CNN works extremely well in representing great data, such as image, video, and so on. Then, why do we need graph convolutional networks? Because lots of viewer application, we need to deal with graph structure data, such as social network, citation network, molecules, point counts, and 3D metrics. <coughs> <coughs> One of the key differences between, uh, between CN and GCN is how the convolutional is computed. The main, difficult, uh, the main difference here is uh, for GCN, we first need to define our convolutional neighborhood. GCNs are powerful, however, most of the state of the GCN model are not deeper than three or four layers. You might wonder, why? It turns out this is non-trivial. The main difficulty here are overfitting, oversmoothing, and wrench gradient. Here you can see the training loss plus of GCN architecture with increasing depth. As you can see, the figure on the left if we stack GCN layer naively, it's not able to train deep GCN to convert. Then, how can we make GCN deeper? We borrow ideas from CNN. First, we introduce West GCN. As mentioned, plan GCN do not convert well if you go deep. But if we introduce West GCN, the network converts with no problem. Here is an example of how to implement West Deal connection for GCN. Similar as WestNet, we add the input feature to the output feature. We also propose Dense GCN, which is inspired, which is inspired by DenseNet. <coughs> Instead of adding the input feature to the output feature, we can get them together.
Another important component is the extension of dilated convolution to graph. We simply dilate the graph convolution by skipping neighbors, as you can see at the bottom. Put them together, this is our network architecture. We extend plan decision to rest decision and dense decision by adding appropriate ski connection and dilated convolution. We are able to train GCNs with more than 100 layers. Now let's see some results. We consider semantic segmentation on point count in our experiment. Using a GCN is a natural try sense point count, uh, another and irregular. We use Stanford 3D large scale indoor data set. As you can see in the table, we all perform state of the art method in 9 out of 30 classes. Here we show a consistent improvement in uh, over our baseline <coughs> across all the classes. Overall, we achieve 4% boost in mean IOU. As you can see, the performance gain becomes bigger as the network goes deeper. We did an extensive ablation study to show the, dif uh, the impact of different components. Yeah, let's look at some visual results very quickly. Our rest decision and dense decision can cover much more subtle detail than plan decision. We also show our method can generalize to different kinds of GCN operator, and we also propose a memory efficient GCN operator. We recently apply our deep GCN to biological graph data and set a new state of the art. We open source our code in both TensorFlow and PyTorch. People already use deep GCN for action detection, 3D object detection, and point count super resolution. This is our amazing team. Come and see our poster for the slow results. Okay, so we have a, a question for the for the first speaker. Um, could you give us some more details about the influence of how you construct the, the neighborhood structure? Right. Um, so I'm happy to make an attempt at answering, but I'm not an author on that paper. Um, just uh, none of the authors could attend. Uh, but from, um, so from my perspective, it seems like uh, one of the approaches would be to, because you have the flow, right, then you can make a prediction of how you transform the points from one frame to the other frames that will lead to placing them spatially near each other. Mm -hmm. Then you can aggregate like in a local uh, spatial neighborhood. Okay, thank you. So here's a, a question for the, for the second speaker. So how would your algorithm deal with nested objects? So imagine, for instance, a, a fruit bowl and then some fruit inside of the, of the bowl where the centroids might be close to each other. Uh, so usually our scenes like uh, because they're constructed from RGBD data, we don't have like an S, like inside like objects inside each other. We're just surfaces. Okay, there there might be it. some instances like a, a cushion on top of a of a of a sofa, for instance, or a, or a chair or something. Yeah, so uh, it can it can easily separate those. Even even if the centroids are close to each other. Uh, so each one, is, yeah, yeah. Uh, each one is somehow dealt separately. Okay. And do you use any data augmentation for for the three D segmentation? Uh, yeah, we do uh, different orientations and uh, and uh, mirror. Okay. Are there any questions around the floor? Thank you. And for the GCN uh, article. Yeah. And so it has been uh, previously a research that after a certain uh, amount of GCN layers that you apply con sequentially, the graph converges, converges into a single point. So how did you deal with that and have you faced this problem? Uh, yes, 
uh, this has lots of um, lots of. Um, it's not only about wind gradient, it's also about uh, over smoothing. So um, if we add the ski connection and then ski connection, we can solve the wind gradient problem. Yeah, but uh, sometimes still have some over smoothing problem. Uh, yeah, this you can deal with the other kind of technology. We are also working on this. Um, the main idea is to change the uh, way the topology that you do the convolution, or you change the way that propagate the information to the center point. Um, yeah, but we're still working on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So another another question for for the same speaker. Another question for you again. Yeah. So can you explain why the performance when you use 112 is lower than when you have 52? Uh, yeah, because this is a memory issue. Um, for the 56 uh, TCM, we use, uh, we use eight neighbors. Yeah. But for the 100 uh, twelve layer, we are not able to use eight neighbor. We only use three nearest neighbor. So uh, yeah, we are because of the memory issue. Okay. Yeah. The setting is um, is a bit uh, unfair. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's thank all the speakers. And the next author, please, come to the podium. Oh. See you again. <laughs> uh, hi, or again. Um, I will present our latest effort on 3D optic detection in point clouds. And this is joint work with uh, Charles Key, Kai Ming He, and Leo Gibas. Uh, first step towards good scene understanding is being able to recognize objects present in the scene and localize them. Specifically, we wish to estimate a bounding box for each object in the scene and the associated semantic class. Even such low dimensional information can already enable many downstream tasks in AR, robotics, and autonomous navigation. Examining prior work, we realized it heavily relies on object detection in 2D. Both bird's eye and frostum based detectors first pro project the scene to a top view or a frontal view. This may cause an irreversible loss of information. Prior work also attempted object detection directly in 3D. However, this time, it was the methodology which was adopted from 2D detection pipelines. Specifically, this requires dense object proposals, which in 3D simply becomes computationally too heavy. Instead of extending a 2D-based approach, we choose to go back to first principles and design a detection pipeline suited for 3D uh, data. 3D data are fundamentally different than 2D images in that they are usually very sparse. Dense proposals are thus not suited for this sparse data, as most compute occurs in empty space. In our approach, instead of exhaustively searching for objects, we simply ask the surface points where they are. This naturally leads to a voting-based idea. Now, the idea to use voting for object detection is not new, of course. In fact, the seminal work on generalized half-transform was introduced almost 40 years ago. Since then, the idea has been extended to detection in images and even 3D point clouds. But in our work, we revive this line of research in the context of deep learning. I'll now describe our fully differentiable detection pipeline with an emphasis on the differences from the traditional half voting. We're given an input point cloud as XYZ. Instead of computing handcrafted descriptors, we process it through a backbone point cloud network. This enriches each point with a high dimensional feature describing its local geometry. We subsample a set of seed points so that each seed point has its XYZ coordinate and a feature. We then learn a mapping from seed features to votes. The votes XYZ position is supervised to predict object centers. Different from traditional half voting, the votes here also have features to store information such as semantics and pose. This results in a natural clustering of votes around object centers. Next, we group the votes by their spatial proximity and aggregate their features through another point network. This is different from the traditional pipeline which runs a clustering algorithm, and by avoiding explicit clustering, we can make this, the aggregation step differentiable. 
Finally, the aggregated vote features generate 3D bounding box predictions with their pose, scale, and semantic class. All the aforementioned steps form a single feed-forward network, which we call VoteNet. Let's see some results. Here we show object detection from depth images taken from the Sun RGBD dataset. On the left column, we see the image of the scene. This information is not used by our network. In the middle, we show the prediction by VoteNet. Note how even in such partial depth points, our network can recognize many small chairs with accurate pose. Here we show results on reconstructed 3D scenes from the ScanNet dataset. These scenes are much larger and contain many more objects, yet the same architecture can still consume the entire scene at once, producing high accuracy predictions. VoteNet outperforms prior methods with significant margins of 3.7 MAP on Sun RGBD and 18.4 on ScanNet. Remarkably, this is achieved without using image information that is essential for competing methods. In addition, our detection on these scenes takes about 100 milliseconds per scan, which is about 20 times faster than a 3D CNN solution. In summary, we introduced VoteNet, a revival of the traditional half-voting technique in a deep learning era. We believe this opens a new exciting line of research. The code is open sourced on GitHub. Thanks for listening and please come check out our poster number 13. Hi everybody, I'm Garrick and I'm here to talk about our work on binocular 3D region proposal networks. This is worked up with my advisor, Dr. Shaoning Liu at Michigan State University. <coughs> so the goal of this work is to implement a single network to perform 2D and 3D monocular object detection. We do so by extending the typical anchors to function in 3D utilizing strong prior statistics. We also introduce depth aware convolution layers in order to leverage the fixed camera geometry as depicted here in blue. Uh, <clears throat> in consequence, we directly predict 3D proposals. Prior works on monocular 3D detection in general utilize external networks, require additional data, and involve multiple stages. Here we show a high level comparison between two prior state-of-the-art methods and ours. Although these methods are effective, they rely on a combination of internal and external stages shown in red and blue respectively. In comparison, our method is a single region proposal network which directly outputs 3D box proposals in an end-to-end -end manner. A core component of this framework is extending the 2D anchors into 3D. We first define the 2D dimensions as usual, and then we add 3D dimensions and the orientation. And lastly, the 3D box center projected in 2D. The center is therefore represented in pixels rather than in meters with a corresponding depth buffer and a scaling factor, following the projection equation as shown. We further utilize the observation angle for the orientation to account for the relative perspective position to the camera, since we're dealing with a 2D image. We generate the prior anchor statistics by clustering all the ground truths of the data set, and then computing the mean value for each cluster in terms of depth, width, length, and the angle which acts as a strong starting point for the detector, essentially a default value. Here we show some example anchors pre-computed for the car class. <coughs> in the left we show the image view, in the right we show the bird's eye view. These anchors naturally act as a sliding window relative to the ground plane projection. For supervision, we follow the standard matching criteria of 0.5 IOU. Once a box has been successfully matched, we learn the transformation relative to the default anchor in order to transform the box into its target ground truth. The transformations are applied following similar equations inspired by 2D detectors comprised of residuals and scalings when applicable. For the loss, we use the typical softmax logistic regression for classification, a smooth L1 for 3D regression, and lastly, a neg an IOU-based negative log loss for the 2D estimations. <clears throat> Our architecture is built upon dense nets as the backbone. We attach a global feature extraction layer followed by output layers for each aforementioned variable. Similarly, we added an equivalently sized local branch, which uses depth-aware convolution instead. 
the depth aware convolution operation simply groups a given feature map spatially into B row wise bins, then applies a different kernel per bin. In this way, unique features can be learned in different levels of depth, assuming a consistent fixed camera view, often found in autonomous and surveillance applications. We set B equal to 32 for the local branch, and B is essentially equivalent to one for the global, since the same kernel is used for each row or each bin. Afterwards, we weightedly fuse the outputs from both the streams and provide the final predictions. Here we detail some of our core experiments, firstly on the bird's eye view localization task, of which our single shot method significantly outperforms prior art by about eight uh, percentage points. <coughs> then on the more challenging task of monocular 3D object detection, where the margin, is, uh, margin for improvement is more evident at around three times the performance of prior art. Next we show a few examples of some qualitative as you can see, our method performs well in diverse scenes and classes. Uh, and emphasizing again, this is just with a single model, single proposal network. And lastly, we show a video sequence including the 3D detections from the bird's eye view, where each grid represents a square meter. We have also released our source code for both training and testing. And please feel encouraged to visit our poster for much more details and discussion. And thank you very much for listening. Hello, my name is Jens Bela, and I'm presenting today our work on uh, LiDAR-based scene understanding, um, which is based on the Kitty uh, vision benchmark and therefore called Semantic Kitty. Um, our main contribution are providing labeled scans for all sequences of the Kitty odometry benchmark, um, covering the full 360 degree field of view. We furthermore propose several benchmark tasks for LiDAR-based scene understanding, initially including semantic segmentation, but also semantic scene completion. In sum, we labeled over 43,000 scans from uh, 22 sequences of the uh, Kitty odometry benchmark, and uh, more specifically, we provide 23,000 scans for training purposes and keep 20,000 scans from 11 sequences for testing purposes that are hidden uh, and evaluated on a uh, server. We labeled 28 classes similar to the class definition of cityscapes and Mapleday Vistas, and they are shown here in this, uh, in this diagram, and we also labeled um, classes distinguishing moving and non-moving objects. The labeling process works as first, uh, follows. We first register all the scans using a LiDAR-based stem system which also enables us to include loop closures, but also provides consistent poses. Using these poses, we then aggregate all the point clouds, we then split it up into tiles, and use these tiles then for labeling, which enables us to consistently label overlapping scans. Our labeling tool uh, is then used for each tile to label the scans from scratch manually, and our labeling tool provides some labeling methods, but also filtering methods as shown here in the, uh, in the video. So with the data set together, we also provide three benchmark tiles. So the first task is semantic segmentation using a single scan as input. Since it's not decidable if an object moves or not moves, in this task we only evaluate all classes that uh, we mapped all moving to non-moving classes uh, together so that we only evaluate the 19 classes in this case. And the second task uh, is natural extension uses then history of scans. So this enables then to also use uh, temporal information by using a buffer of scans, and then predict also moving or non-movable classes. In this case, we then evaluate on all 25 classes on our evaluation server. We evaluated several semantic segmentation baselines on this data set, either treating the points directly at for classification or using a projection-based method which enables to use a range image and use CNS. As you can see from the results, usually the projection-based um, methods worked in our experience better than the uh, point cloud-based methods, which we attribute maybe to the larger backbone used by the uh, um, um, projection-based methods. And this shows maybe also a passport uh, towards improving the point cloud-based methods.
And the final task we propose is a medic scene completion. Here we use uh, the available sequential information to produce uh, voxel grids um, from the frontal view of the car and then produced by aggregating multiple scans and using this in the voxel grid representation to produce uh, the completed scene in front of the car. By using this, we can then produce such uh, completed scenes which we can, can use for the scene completion task. Using this voxel grids, we also determine occluded but also um, non-visible uh, voxels by ray casting, which is also then provided with the data set. We also evaluated here several semantic uh, scene segmentation uh, uh, approaches and an approach combining li LiDAR data but also uh, image information using an attention mechanism performs here best. But as you can see from the results, there is maybe some additional work needed to um, reach the performance also of indoor scene completion approaches. And finally, we are planning to um, extend the task over time, but also included already in the data set instance segmentation for all classes like uh, humans and uh, vehicles for the whole data set. And um, you can find more information on the data set and information on the tools used and the downloads on this website shown here. Thank you for your attention. Your time for question and answering. Is there any question from the floor? Okay, I have one question for uh, the first speaker. Yeah. So, how is the scale recovered? Is it also regressed or based on class uh, based files? Sorry, the scale of the box, of the detected box? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, is, that is information that carried around with the votes. So after the aggregation, mm. all votes suggested from surface points can agree together on the dimension of the detected box. I see. Then I so that's predicted from the features. Yeah, then how is the dimension of this hop space in your case? Demand of the hop space. So basically, hop voting, basically you have to construct this uh, voting right. space, right? No, so so it's, it's important to make the distinction between the half transform, which yeah. really goes to another space, and the journalist half transform version that actually assigns a 3D location to each of the sure. points, right? So, but the differences from the traditional half uh, voting are, are default, basically, right? So one is that um, we can actually recover a model boxes. Mm. That is a crucial difference, right? Because you don't have to go back and, and use the existing points to predict the, the box. Uh, another one is that we can make predictions for something other than the centroid, right? Because we can carry feature information uh, in that. And lastly, it's, it's we're fully differentiable. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one. I have one question for the first speaker. Uh, have you ever considered the weighted aggregation of hop voting? So a weighted aggregation? Yep. W what, can you extend, expand on that? So you can use the classification score to when you aggregate the uh, voting. So right. Yeah. So in some sense, you, you, you can imagine that this is what's done when you cluster together votes coming from different surface points. So surface points have opinions, quote unquote, on what should be the recovered object, right? And when we cluster them together, they all agree that they're in the same location or that they're um, near the object center, but the feature carries information on what type of objects they predict. So one point may think the center of the object is actually a center of a chair, while, while the other 20 points can say this is the center of a sofa. Right? Hopefully, by aggregating them together, we can filter out those outliers and recover the correct class. Okay, thank you. Sure. So we have one question for the second speaker. Second speaker, yeah. So the proposed reason proposal network. So can it also apply to unseen object categories during training? Can it apply to different object categories? Yeah, unseen yeah. categories. Unseen categories. In, during training. Uh, I suppose if you had some uh, unseen categories, I, I would be surprised because they're it's specifically trained on certain classes. So I guess if you switch to a more of a generic ob objectness, more like the original uh, fast RCN, then maybe it could uh, also pick up just foreground generically. Okay, thank you. And uh, one more follow-up question for the second speaker. Uh, how does your method generalize for different viewpoint uh, data set? Uh, for example, I mean, this question is about this viewpoint invariant of your method. Yeah. Um, my expectation would be that it would need to be retrained per different uh, 
whenever the, the camera, because we really leverage the, the uh, we really exploit that sort of correlation between the, a fixed camera. Mm -hmm. So I think if you change the camera, you probably will need to uh, retrain, at least to some degree, depending on, okay. on the change itself. That's, uh, but we haven't tested it, we only train on, on your kitty. Uh, thank you. Then let's thank the speakers again. speaker of the next group please. Hello ICC, I'm Ganesh Sishtu from Valio. Today I'm presenting our paper Woodscape, a multitask multi-camera fisheye data set for autonomous driving. Fisheye cameras make use of non-linear mapping to generate large field of view. Due to this advantage they are often employed in video surveillance, augmented reality and autonomous driving. Fisher cameras allows 360 degrees near field perception around a vehicle that enables to automate parking, low speed and high speed maneuvering and emergency braking. In spite of its prevalence, there are few publicly available data sets to measure performance of computer vision algorithms on fisheye images. Our data set is created to encourage research community to develop customized models for fisheye images. Recently, multitask learning has become a common paradigm in autonomous driving due to efficient hardware utilization and generalization with limited amount of data. But majority of the automotive data sets are limited in tasks and restricting the research from exploring more than three or four tasks. Also, an interesting area of research which is less explored due to lack of data sets is joint modeling of multiple cameras. To address these issues, we introduce Woodscape, a multitask, multi-camera Fisher data set for visual perception. Woodscape is named after Robert William Wood, who coined the term Fisher in 1906. We also propose an efficient metric for 3D bounding box. While our data set has annotations for standard perception tasks like 2D and 3D bounding box detection, semantic segmentation, and visual odometry, we also provide annotations for novel tasks like lens soiling detection. We, we hope that this, this task helps the researchers to induce adversarial conditional knowledge into their models. Woodscape is the first data set with synthetic data having annotations for segmentation and depth, encouraging the researchers to look towards domain adaptation and corner case mining. We also provide pixel level annotations to motion segmentation. Other, other tasks include depth and end-to-end -end lighting. In this table, we compared Woodscape with the existing data sets. Previously, the only data set with more than, more than three or four tasks is Kitty, we, but it is limited by a single front-facing narrow field of view camera. But Woodscape is a data set uh, with 360 degrees perception with four fisheye cameras and nine tasks. As I said earlier, Woodscape is, having, is the only data set with novel tasks like soiling detection, motion segmentation, and synthetic data. All the baseline models will be uploaded to our GitHub repo. Preliminary results are already been shown in our paper. Our data set is acquired from three geographical locations, North America, Europe, and Asia. We used a combination of methods like classifier accuracy, image hashing, environmental and geographical conditions to enforce diversity in the data. As shown in the below density maps, our efficient sampling enabled us to sample the data, data images, sorry, images with critical objects near, close to the car, like within 30 meters. The table presented at the below left side shows the sensors mounted on our vehicles. We provide intrinsics and extrinsics for all the sensors. The LiDAR ground truth is provided to a subset of data, whereas GNN, I, GNSS and IMU sensor data is provided to SLAM and odometry related tasks. We believe that release of Woodscape encourages, the do, encourages development of native fisheye models instead of applying standard models on undistorted fisheye images because distortion correction modifies the scene structure as well as results in loss of whole field of view. In case of deep learning algorithms, Woodscape can help to understand whether the distortions can be learned or have to be modeled explicitly. We hope that community will explore models that are sample aware 
spatial aware and distortion aware. We believe that Fisher images are not actually distorted images, but they because distortion means error. Fisher images are valid projections, but requires nonlinear manifold mapping instead of standard linear projections. We would like to thank everyone who supported us in creating Woodscape dataset. Please meet us at our poster. Hello, I'm Jung from the University of Adelaide. Here is our work, Scalable Place Recognition Under Appearance Change for Autonomous Driving. One of the most important components in self-driving cars is planning and navigation. In order to perform planning and navigation, the cars must know where they are which is called place recognition. However, one of the most challenging problems for place recognition is to be robust against appearance change. As you can see in our example, three images captured from the same place, but in different weathers and times of day look very different. To address the issues, all the works try to find an image representation which is invariant to appearance change. Different from them, our proposed solution has two parts. First part is to perform temporal inference with hidden Markov model in the graph representations. Second part is to keep updating the map and image database because we believe that the richer database is, the more robust we are. However, since we continuously update the map, the map is bigger and bigger over time. So we propose a method to compress the graph when updating a new query. <coughs> Here is a graph representation of Adelaide downtown. Given a data set of M videos, we represent image indices, all places, as a set of nodes. All nodes are connected to their neighbors. Query video is a set of query frames up to time t. The ways of edges, a transition matrix E, the observation model OT, is created from image retrieval. Then the belief BT is calculated using matrix computations. As shown in our example, query QT is mapped to node 23 and 116 because their belief is higher than a threshold. Then, to compress the graph, we perform curling to update node QT to node 23 and 116. Now, since node 23 and 116 are mapped to node QT, they are likely representing the same place. So we combine three nodes, QT, 23, and 116 together. Now the graph is compressed. Here we demonstrate our compression method on Atlas CBD dataset obtained from Mabillary. Thanks to our map compressions, the graph is smaller over time. By contrast, with our map compression method, the graph is bigger when queries is updated to the map. For scalable purpose, we use K-means tree to index the image database. When we update the query video to the K-means tree, the complexity is just in log scale. So this operation is scalable. Here is our experiment on offered robot car compared to learning methods which take around 6 to 14 hours for retraining. We only need few minutes for updating. In terms of inference time, because we do matrix computation, that is fast. So it only takes around 4 milliseconds per image.
compared to other place recognition methods because our method can perform temporal inference efficiently. We get a very smooth prediction leading to better mean localization errors. Thank you for your attention and welcome to our poster for more information. Hello everyone, my name is Felipe Codevila and I'll be presenting you the work entitled Exploring the Limitations of Behavior Cloning for Autonomous Driving. So the US alone can produce yearly a trillion miles of dri driving data. This data, however, cannot be used to enhance autonomous driving systems without the previous time-consuming data labeling. A potential solution to that is to train a single neural network that can directly map sensor data into actions. This process could use all available human demonstrations, and this technique is called end-to-end -end driving fuel behavior cloning. Some recent advances have brought behavior cloning to a very consistent performance, yet this technique has not scaled to more complex behaviors than the one you see here, like lane following or vehicle following. And recently, we can see in the literature a, ten a tendency to like try to modularize this technique, but however, no extensive empirical examination to the end-to-end -end behavior cloning was yet performed. And that's what we So as our research plans are formed, we use the Carlos simulator, and we use it several common machine learning techniques to enhance the conditional end-to-end -end behavior cloning baseline. As expected, but with some necessary tweaking, we found that better data, deeper networks, better hyperparameters, and image network training were able to greatly improve our results. Improve in a way that our agent was able to surpass the state of the art on the Carla Coral 2017 benchmark. So here we, we are gonna show uh, some how it drives on Carla. We observed that it developed a better policy than the others. And this agent was able to act by only observing the image on the bottom left corner. Uh, we can see that, that when we analyze the attention map that it has actually some correlation to the cues that are necessary for driving. So after that, to better analyze this agent, we proposed a more complex benchmark called No Crash uh, that focused more on the performance of the agent under the presence of, of, of dynamic objects. Uh, when we benchmark on, on this case, all, all, all the agents, including ours, performed very poorly. And we couldn't like, improve it further by using the same techniques of more data or changing the hyperparameters. But when trying to improve this, we observed some limitations that are the main message of this paper. The first, um, now the limitations. Um, the first limitation that we observed is the data set bias. We can see as we increase the amount of data, the results stop improving and can even get worse in generalization conditions. Uh, a first example of bias that we have is the inertia problem. We can see that at any data set that we collect, when the expert demonstration is at low speed, it tends to maintain itself at this low speed for a while. And this creates a low, wrong correlation that low speed results into no throttling. So with this, every time uh, the vehicle goes to an unfamiliar environment, it will tend to stay stopped after it stops for the first time, because it's the, like the main variable that it has for considering. The other limitation is that training these kinds of models have very low reliability. The training model can have a drastic sensibility to the random factors such as network initialization or image sampling order. And by changing just these variables, you can have a difference in of up to 42% into performance. Um, this example that we show now is the throttle distribution of two models where the only difference between them is the random seed. We can see that model S1 developed a policy that uh, has much more presence of throttling than model S2. So 
uh, in summary, we see that behavior cloning is a powerful technique that can still obtain state-of-the-art results, yet it has several limitations that should be addressed in order to properly scale it to real-world environment. So a special attention has to be made for the data set. So uh, we have the code available, data set available Zoom, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, the people, the final presentation, I'd like to ask the audience, please sit until the final QA is finished, if you can, uh, to show respect to the speakers and the other audience listening, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying until the end. We present Habitat, a long-term effort to create a common task framework supporting research in embodied AI. We are motivated by the emerging shift in the community from AI tasks based on internet image data sets to embodied AI tasks involving active agents that perceive, plan to navigate, and interact with the world while communicating with people through natural language. Embodied AI tasks involve perceiving of the world, acting to affect changes, and communicating with people while doing so. These tasks require a transition from using popular static image data sets such as Pascal, Coco, and ImageNet to using simulation platforms that allow evaluation of an embodied agent on active tasks. Our vision is to create a simulation platform allowing for consistent evaluation through community benchmarks and standardized metrics. Our goal is to standardize the embodied AI software stack. This starts with constructing a data set layer that can use any existing and future 3D environments, then a simulation layer that learns from the successes of recent efforts and focuses on generality and performance, and on top of this, a task specification layer for defining and evaluating embodied AI tasks. These three layers form the Habitat platform. The Habitat sim simulation backend supports efficient and scalable rendering of navigation trajectories within a large number of 3D data sets at frame rates exceeding 10,000 frames per second for uh, commodity GPU devices, providing orders of magnitude improvements in performance from previous comparable platforms that are typically limited to hundreds of frames per second. The Habitat uh, API framework allows flexible specification of embodied AI tasks, including point goal navigation, object semantic-based navigation, uh, navigation to particular rooms or uh, regions, as well as tasks involving natural language reasoning, such as instruction following tasks and embodied question answering tasks. A key strength of Habitat is highly performant simulation with frame rates of more than 4,000 frames per second per simulation thread, shown here in blue across a range of frame resolutions in the horizontal axis. These frames are available in common learning libraries such as PyTorch through direct GPU memory sharing. Now, why does speed matter? These performance improvements allow us to carry out experiments that were impractical up to now. We revisit results from two recent works comparing learned and classical navigation methods for embodied agents. This prior work concludes that classical approaches based on SLAM and handcrafted uh, policies outperform learned approaches. However, the results are based on five million steps of total experience as shown in the horizontal axis here, with the vertical axis indicating overall navigation performance. Here we contrast a classical SLAM approach in green to RL-based agents with different visual sensors in other colors as we scale the amount of experience. We see that the trend is reversed with depth-equipped RL agents in cyan and red outperforming the traditional SLAM-based approach. In these uh, point uh, goal navigation uh, episodes that are being evaluated, the agent starts at the blue point and must navigate to the red point. And for the blind RL agent shown here on the left, we see the emergence of interesting navigation behaviors, which recover wall hugging and backtracking and successfully navigate to the goal despite a lack of visual sensors. In contrast, the depth-equipped agents are much more efficient at navigating to the goal, avoiding collisions with obstacles and the need to backtrack. 
These results are only the first step towards long-term development of habitat. More recently, we have enabled importing of uh, virtual objects into environments uh, that you see here in the top left, physics-based interaction with objects in the top right, as well as simulated actuation and sensor noise in the bottom left, and uh, deployment of agents trained in simulation to real robots through integration with the PyRobot framework seen in the bottom right. In the past, community data sets have enabled much progress. We believe the future belongs to simulators, and with Habitat, we hope to support the community in exploring the frontier of embodied AI. Come join us as we push towards that frontier. Thank you. Can we have all the speakers on the stage, please? And are there any questions from the audience? So we have a, a question for the first speaker. So do you, do you expect that commercial self-driving cars will use fisheye cameras? Uh, instead of traditional ones? I expect that it would be a combination of fish and front facing cameras. So does your data set also contain sequences that have been acquired with normal cameras? No, we would like to focus on fish because there are already so many data sets available with front facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a, a question for the third speaker from the audience, so um, have you tested or how could you test your model for real world accident scenarios? Well, it's very hard to do extensive evaluation in the real world without like spending lots of resources, so we have, but the proxy that we have is simulation. But do you see a way in which you could maybe? Yeah, you can do some kind of evaluation, but not this same kind of extensive evaluation, let's say. You can you can do start by doing extensive benchmark and simulated environment, and then you can go to the real world and test of some promising hypothesis. Okay, thank you. So a question for the last speaker. So do models that have been trained on a habitat, do they transfer well to real world uh, robotic scenarios? Uh, we are investigating that at this moment and seeing some promising early results uh, for specifically for uh, navigation tasks, but uh, this is ongoing work. Okay, so some of the, the small objects, some of them seem to have low quality even in the replica data set and um, they're also missing depth value sometimes, so how, how do you think you will overcome this? Yeah, definitely there um, Despite much progress in reconstruction, there still exists a, a gap between reality and simulation. Uh, I think there's a complementary research agenda which looks at, at this domain gap and transfer methods for uh, taking some uh, approach that had been trained in simulation and then uh, applying uh, some transfer method to ensure that performance remains high in reality. Is there any intention to maybe use some real world data? Just yeah, cer certainly that's a possibility for uh, s smaller scale real data. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for the first speaker. So how much, how much denser are the point clouds than, for instance, the Kitty data set? I'm sorry, I missed it. How much denser are the point clouds than the, t the Kitty data set? Uh, fish MS are quite, quite good at uh, having higher pixel density to the object closer to the ego vehicle. So definitely if the objects are within 10 to 20 meters, the density of the point cloud would be much higher than narrow field of view cameras. Okay. okay, thank you. So this, this concludes the session, thank you.